What this meant was, in short, that if something was found by these archaeologists that could be used to support the scriptural teaching of the time, then we, the public, would be informed about it. Anything else was mythology. <laughs> if it did not suit the interpretation, it was not destined to see the light of day in the public domain. That was a hundred years ago. We still suffer from many of these, these types of regulation today. There was a hell of a lot discovered out there in these countries that we don't get to hear about. It's put under wraps, it's kept in closeted rooms beneath the museums, but we don't get to learn the truth of it. So what we're going to do, I think, t today really, is just to, to look at one example of a particularly monumentous find of, of that era, of the late 18, uh, 1800s, We'll look at one particular discovery, just to give you an idea of the sort of thing that has been veiled from us. In my opinion, this is probably the most important biblical discovery ever made. There is little, if anything, beyond academic and closeted circles that have written about it at all. Within the context of the book of Exodus, there's a significant mountain named in the Bible. It sits in the, the range of the Sinai Peninsula, which is an upturned triangle that, that's between um, Egypt and Jordan. It's firstly called Mount Horeb. It's secondly called Mount Sinai. It's then called Mount Horeb again. And that's the name that it sticks with as the story progresses. And the story, of course, is, is that of Moses bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and, and they meet with Jehovah on the holy mountain of Horeb in Sinai. At the time of Moses, roughly 1360 BC, that sort of era, there actually was no mountain called Mount Sinai. We, we must know that at the outset. There wasn't even a mountain by that name in the time of Jesus, and not even for another three or four hundred years did Mount Sinai exist in geographical record. The translation of the Old Testament that we have today was compiled in a little before the year 1000. It is actually 600 years newer than the New Testament that we have today. So giving places names that they knew about in the year 1000 when the crusades were th thought about being launched and that sort of thing they were giving places names that they knew at that time not necessarily names that applied back in the time of Moses and the others so that the people of that era would know exactly where they were talking about now the mountain generally called Mount Sinai now sits in the south of that triangular peninsula it was actually given its name and called Mount Sinai in the fourth century a, a, a mission of Greek Christian monks decided to build a little mission there and they decided that this was Mount Sinai of the Bible. It's sometimes called Jebel Musa which means Mount of Moses and there's a, a small Christian retreat there today it's called St Catherine's Monastery. But was that the mountain that actually was the Mount Sinai of the Bible or the Mount Horeb of the Bible? It transpires that it was not. Exodus actually goes to, to some length to explain to us exactly where this magical mountain was. The mountain that Moses and the Israelites went to on their way from Egypt across to the land of Midian. It tells us that they, they crossed the, the, the wilderness regions of Shur and, and Paran and, and they came to this mountain. Well in actual fact if one follows the route on the map, exactly the route that's given to us in Exodus, that they are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the Mount Sinai that sits on our maps today. In fact, they travel so north across Sinai that they are within hundreds of miles of the Red Sea. They actually cross the strip of land at the top where the, the Suez Canal sits today. So it um, seems rather strange that they should have diverted by hundreds of miles to, to, to cross the Red Sea at a point where Moses had to part the waters wasn't the case. They were very north of that and it tells us where they went across there. It tells us exactly where Mount Horeb was. The word Horeb is a, an Arabic word. It simply means desert. Mount Horeb was desert mountain and desert mountain is, is, is something which has been well known for a long long time 
and at the moment, this time and for, for the last, well, for this century, it's been called um, the mountain of Serabit, Serabit El Kadim, the prominence of the Kadim. This sits about 2,600 feet above sea level, exactly where Exodus tells us it was, on the route from Egypt, the land of Goshen, across to the land of Midian. Well, in the late 1890s, the British Egyptologist Sir Flinders Petrie of the University College in London decided to apply to the Egyptian Exploration Fund for money to go and investigate this mountain. By 1904, he and the team were there. They were standing at the foot of Mount Serabit. And in the following year, Petrie published privately the results of their findings with photographs, records, and maps. But he added to his notes to this publication that the report that he made, despite its funding source, would not generally be made public by the Egyptian Exploration Fund. The subscribers to the fund would receive maps, they would receive little bits of information, but the detail of what they found would not be mentioned at all. The officers would simply tell even their own members what they wanted to tell from the results of Petrie's findings. Why? Had he in fact broken some regulation of, of the articles? Had he found something that he wasn't supposed to find? Well, that's exactly what had happened. He discovered the secret of this magical, sacred mountain of Moses. A secret which not only made absolute sense of the portrayals that we have in Exodus, but which blew the lid totally from the common scriptural interpretation of that. Sinai was not a foreign land to the Egyptians. It was actually part of Egypt. It came under pharaonic control, so Moses and the Israelites, when they left Egypt and crossed into Sinai, were theoretically, for that moment in time, still in Egypt. Sinai came under the control of some particular public officials. One was called the Royal Chancellor, other was called the Royal Messenger, and these people governed Sinai. Moses' era was the era of Egypt's, Egypt's 18th dynasty, and in fact we know exactly who the governors of Sinai were in the 18th dynasty. We know their names, we know their families. The royal messenger was a guy called Nebi. And he was also mayor and troop commander in the set town of Zaru, which in fact was the chief town in Goshen where the Israelites had come from. It's where they spent their, their, their years in Egypt. The royal chancellor was held in, in the family of Pa-Nihas. Panahesi of this family was the official governor of Sinai at the time. The family of Pa-Nihas goes right back into the kingship of ancient Troy. It's, 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 it's a, a family that, that moves through kingship all the way through history. And at that time, Panihas was governing Canaan. The Bible calls him Phineas. So we, when we read about Phineas becoming one of the first pre priests of the Egyptian um, church, uh, of the Israelite church, this is Panihas. This is the governor of Sinai, a very important man. Another thing to understand before we follow Petri into, into the discovery is that there was an immense difference at the time, although the Bible doesn't make it clear, between a group of people called Hebrews and a group of people called Israelites. They weren't the same thing at all. The Hebrews were the, the family descendants of Abraham. They were descendants of his line and in essence they lived in the land of Canaan and in Palestine. The Israelites were no more nor less than the descendants of one of Abraham's grandsons. This was the grandson called Jacob, who changed his name to Israel, who took the family to Egypt, where they spent many centuries before coming out with Moses. And these, this family were called Israelites, children of Israel, the founder of the family. So what we have to recognize about the story of the mountain of Moses is that when Moses came out of Egypt, he came out of Egypt with Israelites, not with Hebrews. The whole point of the story of the laws and the ordinances given at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, was really a part of bringing the Israelites back into the Hebrew community, a foreign land, where they actually had to learn new rules, new regulations, new laws, to be part of the family that they themselves originally grew from. So that's, that's kind of where it sits. Israelites were not Hebrews. 
In time to come, the word Jews comes up in history, Judeans. They weren't necessarily Hebrews or Israelites, they were simply people who lived in Judea. Today, all of these words get roped into one, and they're, they're sort of one people. So the Israelites had spent something like 400 odd years living in a part of Egypt, up there in the Nile Delta, in the land of Goshen, the, the head city of which was Zaru. Through 400 years, having no contact personally, hardly at all, with their Hebrew relatives in Canaan, they grew up in a completely different environment. They grew up in an environment that didn't have this single Jehovah God as their God. They grew up in a country with a pantheon of gods. Um, it was the Egyptian law that they followed. However, being of the family that they were, they, they, they still hit upon the idea of following a kind of Hebrew concept and they, they had a one God concept among themselves in, in Goshen. And they simply called this God Lord, Adon, Adonai, my Lord. And this is one of the reasons why the names Lord and Jehovah crop up independently in the Bible. Uh, but we read them as if they're the, uh, talking about the same person. For the most part they're not. One God was the Lord, the other God was Jehovah. Jehovah was strictly for the Hebrews. To the Egyptians, the name Adon was pronounced Aten, A-T-E-N, and it's from that that we get the name of Pharaoh Akhenaten, servant of Aten. This was a one God concept which Akhenaten brought into Egypt just before the time of Moses. So even Egypt had within that Goshen area this one God ideal. Across the water the Hebrews had the one God ideal, but it was a different God. So when Moses came into Sinai with, with the Israelites, they didn't arrive as worshippers of Jehovah when they got to this magic mountain. They were worshippers of Aten. And it was for this very reason, as I mentioned, that they were given a whole new set of laws and ordinances to comply with the Hebrew culture of their prospective new homeland. So back to Flinders Petrie. He goes to the mountain, and he knows that there's going to be something there. Quite how he knows, he doesn't explain. But he knows that this is the mountain, and he knows that if he looks hard enough, he's going to find a secret there. Well, to start with, they found nothing very much at all. But on a wide plateau, very near the summit of this mountain, they found things that made them believe there had been habitation there. There were things around that looked like buildings sticking out of this plateau, 2,600 feet up a mountain. There were great pillars, standing stones, protruding out of a whole heap of rubble. So he decided to have a look and see what was underneath this rubble. This rubble had been deposited by winds and landslides over 3,000 years. But when it was finally moved away, Petri wrote at that time, there is no other monument known which makes us regret more that it is not in better preservation. The whole of this was buried. No one had any knowledge of it until we cleared the site. What they found high up on Mount Horeb, 2,000 feet above sea level, was an enormous Egyptian temple. 230 feet of it spread out above ground. Another part of it spread out within a cave below ground, cut into the mountainside with, with, with short edges and polished sides. And the various inscriptions and cartouches around this temple and on the walls and the standing stones led him to discover that this had been an operative Egyptian temple right back to the time of the very first dynasty of Egypt. We're looking at Moses in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, so that's going back a long, long way. And this temple had been operative all, the, all through that time, 3000 BC. The above ground part of the temple was, was mostly sandstone, quarried from the mountain itself. It comprised a series of halls and corridors, shrines, cubicles, chambers, and of these, the, the, the features that, that are now open for inspection are the main sanctuary, the shrine of kings, the portico court, these are big. Um, the hall of the goddess Hathor. The whole of this temple complex that Moses took the Israelites to, where they apparently met with Jehovah to receive the Ten Commandments and the new ordinances was a temple of the goddess Hathor. 
She appears on reliefs all around the place. The cave cut into the rock is dedicated to Hathor. The walls that are smoothed and polished like marble have her pictures all over them. And yet this is supposed to be the magic mountain of Jehovah. Deep within the cave, Petri found a limestone standing stone of the pharaoh Ramesses I. Now all of the experts today tell us that Ramesses was a hater of the art and cult in Egypt. Not what Ramesses himself said. He describes himself with the title, I am Ramesses, I am the ruler of all that art and embraces. So the experts are telling us untruths even today about what these pharaohs were about. Also found was a, a, a statue head of the mother of Moses within this temple. So it proved that not only had it been in constant use right back from about 3000 BC, even by the time that Moses got there in about 1330 BC, it was already being used in that recent period. It was constantly in use, this great temple. In the halls and the courts of the outer temple, there are stone tanks, rectangular basins and, and, and baths and all sorts of curiously shaped tables and benches that nobody could make any sense out of. They didn't look like altars. They had recessed fronts, they had split level surfaces and the whole thing reminded them more of a laboratory than it did of a temple. There were alabaster vases, there were containers and all these are shaped like lotus flowers and, 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 and things like that. There, there are all sorts of articles there. There were wands there, they called them wands, they were like little uh, um, priest sticks and even today they can't quite work out what they're made of. The material is very, very hard. These things are all designed, but they're not designed in the normal Egyptian style. They have basket work, they have lattice work, they have a style of, of, of design that is more Mesopotamian than, is, than Egyptian, and yet this is an Egyptian temple. They also found a few other very strange things. When they move into the Hathor temple complex, which appears to be the central point at where all of the, this energy comes from, they begin to find some strange things. Conical stones set very carefully on a shelf, little cones of stone. A metallurgist's crucible was very apparent. Now these kind of things began to get Petri and his people wondering, well what on earth had, had these things got to do with a temple? There was nothing in temple law that said that metallurgist crucibles were, were part of what went on. And all over the temple, all over the walls and on the various stones, was something venerated, highly venerated, within the temple complex, and it was called Mufkuts. Doesn't mean a lot to us today, Mufkuts. Okay, Mufkuts. They found 2,600 feet above sea level in the mountain of the Bible, conical stones, metallurgist crucibles, tanks, basins, lotus flower equipment, all sorts of wands and tubing that look like an laboratory and references venerating some mysterious substance called mufkuts. Now, they knew that these things were all linked together, but they didn't know how, so they began to, to try and work out what on earth mufkuts was. Some said it was probably copper. Many preferred the idea of turquoise, others have supposed it was perhaps malachite. But the funny thing about these guesses was that none of these materials was apparent within the temple complex. There was no malachite, there was no turquoise, there was no copper. Sinai is noted for its turquoise mines, but if mining had been a primary function of that temple over two to three thousand years, you'd expect to find turquoise stones in the tombs of Egypt. There are barely any at all. So if they were working for 3,000 years mining turquoise, they clearly only found about half a dozen. <laughs> copper, they said. Well, it didn't take them long to realize that if you were mining and smelting copper, um, you need very different equipment to this sort of equipment. This was not... This was not metal rectification equipment in the way that they knew it. Copper was apparent in Sinai, but down in the deep valleys there were smelting works, old smelting works, and they were nothing like this temple at all. There was no residue of copper anywhere except references to mufkuts.
Another cause of wonderment as they travelled around this, as they kept removing all of this rubble, was that they kept seeing inscribed references to bread. Everywhere there were references to bread, and bread was always written alongside mufkuts. The other thing that happened all the time was that the, the most prominent of all the hieroglyphic signs outside that was the, the sign for light. Now, bread and light and mufkuts all seemed to be equally important within this temple complex. This was nothing to do with copper. It had something to do with these strange tanks, these strange laboratory tables with their recessed fronts and split-level surfaces. So, bread, mufkuts, light, conical stones, metallurgist crucibles, all of these posed a problem until they decided to clear the rubble from a series of square storerooms in one of the parts of the temple. As they removed the rubble, they came across slabs of stone beneath the rubble. They moved the slabs of stone, and beneath these, carefully stored in every one of about four or five of these large square rooms, a few inches deep, packed tight on the floor, were tons and tons of the finest, purest, unadulterated white powder. So, said the experts, this is clearly the result of copper smelting. This clearly was from the burning of plants to produce alkali. Quite why they would want to produce alkali, nobody really knew, but the more they tested it, the more they found that there was no plant residue there at all. And in fact, if they were going to have a temple for the burning of plants, they actually would have done better down in the valleys where there were more trees, not 2,600 feet up a mountain. So for want of any other explanation, it was decided that the white powder and the stones were perhaps associated with the sacrificial rite. They're clinging at straws here all the time, trying to work out what on earth this was. This is probably animal sacrifice. Well, as pointed out by somebody who wasn't even the brightest member of the team, this was an Egyptian temple. There is nothing anywhere in history which says that the Egyptians ever used animal sacrifice for anything. It wasn't part of their, their, their religious structure at all. They tested the powder, they winnowed it in the breeze, they did everything they could. There was not a bone, a chip, a stone, a piece of plant, a piece of skin, anything in this powder. And it was described as being hard-packed talcum powder which was impalpable to touch and just blew away in the breeze the moment you flicked it into the air. Petri wrote, Though I searched these ashes in dozens of instances, winnowing them in a breeze, I never found a fragment of bone, skin, plant, or anything else. So some of the mysterious powder was sent back to Britain for analysis and examination. The results for what they were, were never actually published. <laughs> when people went back to have a look at the rest of the powder, and they reckoned there was about 50 tons of this, it had all, of course, been left a victim to the desert winds and um, erosion and rainfall and whatever, and that was the end of that. What became apparent, however, when checking out other inscriptions at the temple, was that this mufkuts, this powder, had something to do with what the Mesopotamians called highwood firestone. It's the same thing. Mufkuts turned out to be highwood firestone. They called it the sacred Shem Anna, from which derived, of course, the biblical word manna. And this is the importance of the word bread that kept appearing through the thing. There was some tie-up between this powder and, and and, and the, and the Shem manner of the, um, of the Mesopotamians. Light, the word light was always there. Whenever Shem manner was mentioned, whenever Mufkuts or Highwood Firestone was mentioned, the symbol for light was always there alongside it. It was decided, and it turns out probably quite correctly, that this Mufkuts was exactly the same powder that the book of Exodus actually talks about. It tells us about powder. It tells us about the Israelites being fed with a particular powder at that time. It tells about the importance of manufacturing something called showbread for the tabernacle and, and, and the altar of the temple. 
Show bread is exactly the same as show manna, and Shem Anna is exactly what the Mesopotamians used to call it. It's the same thing. But the book of Exodus tells us that the guy who made the showbread for Moses' tabernacle was a guy called Bezalel. Now Bezalel, it goes to great pains to tell us, was a goldsmith and a master craftsman. So this fellow has got the instructions, and they're laid down in the Bible for us to read, to make candlesticks, to make golden bowls, to make platters, to make all the ornaments for the Ark of the Covenant, and to make this bread, the goldsmith. Master craftsman is a particularly important word, and the more I looked for this definition, master craftsman, the more I found going back and back and back in time. The definition exists way back to about 4000 BC. These were the great Vulcans, the text tell us. The master craftsmen were the great Vulcans. They were the people in charge of the furnaces. They were the people who made the highwood firestone. So as for the crucible and the conical stones and the tanks and the tables and all of the equipment at Sinai, it was actually determined by the Petri team that this temple was clearly a laboratory. So the report went back to London and I began by telling you what they didn't tell us. What they found was the alchemical workshop of the Pharaoh Akhenaten and of the 18 dynasties of pharaohs before him. A temple laboratory where the furnace smoked and roared just as the book of Exodus tells us in the production of the highwood firestone, the Shemana. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the mountain quaked greatly. That's what it tells us. Prior to that, it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, and behold, there was a smoking furnace, a burning lamp passed between the pieces. The burning bush seen by Moses, which was a fire, a blaze, exploded, but was not consumed, and an angel came out of it. If you think about it, it's pretty well identical to the experiment that David Hudson did with his pencil. The blaze of light, it had no effect on the object within it. It's the same story. In Exodus we read that Moses took the golden calf. We're now on the mountain. The Israelites had made a golden calf. He burnt it in the fire and ground it to a powder. Now nobody has actually queried these words, it seems to me. But if you burn gold in a fire, you get... white powder. This was exactly the process of a Shemana furnace as the Egyptian records tell us. And that's precisely what was going on at this temple. They were actually making this stuff. 50 tons of it. Moses' own great-grandfather was the pharaoh Tuthmosis III. Tasmothis III had reorganized the ancient mystery schools of Toth in Egypt and founded the Royal School of the Master Craftsmen at Karnak. At the time, they called them the Great White Brotherhood because of their preoccupation with a mysterious white powder. A branch of the fraternity became known as the Therapeutate. They were a healing community, so this had something to do with medicine as well. The Therapeutate, in fact, set up branches all over Palestine and Syria, and they, a branch of, of that Therapeutate, were the Essenes at Qumran in the time of Jesus. So clearly, these guys were into this as well. Hathor. All of this is dedicated to Hathor, not to Jehovah. She was the great mother. She is the oldest identified deity figure of Egypt. She turns up on the oldest artifact ever known from 3000 odd BC and her story when it's being told in documented form runs in parallel with a historical character called the great Vulcan Tubal Cain. Now Tubal Cain is actually mentioned in the Bible. Tubal Cain was um, one of the descendants of Cain in the line from Eve. Tubal Cain, even today, is revered by Freemasons worldwide. 
They don't know why, they just know that Tubal Cain was very important and that Tubal Cain was a master metallurgist. He was a great Vulcan. Now Hathor is particularly interesting in Egypt because Hathor is not only there at the very beginning of Egyptian time, she's there at the very, very end of it. Right at the, the end of the Pharaonic era when Queen Cleopatra is sort of winding down the whole thing and the Romans are moving in and we're in about 30, 40 BC, she's the penultimate pharaoh of them all, make sure that she has her one and only relief of her carved on the temple of Hathor. Hathor was a nursing goddess. Hathor was said to be the daughter of Ra. She was said to have given birth to the sun. She was the queen of the west. She was the one who knew the right spells, whatever they were. She was the protectress of womanhood, the lady of the sycamore, wine, tombs, song. But the importance of Hathor was that it was from the powdered milk of Hathor that the pharaohs gained their divinity. Now we know now what the powdered milk of Hathor was. It was the powder being manufactured at the Hathor temple. They wondered at the time why this would not have been done in Egypt. But as I said earlier, Sinai was Egypt. It was the same country. It just happened to be the other side of the water. Now one of the, the, the rock carvings by the cave at, at the mountain is a representation of Moses' own great-grandfather, Tosmosis IV, in the presence of Hathor. And on this wonderful carved relief stands top with lotus flowers and a man presenting Tosmosis with a loaf of white bread. A conical loaf of white bread. Another stella details the mason, Ankib, offering two conical bread cakes to the king. And there are portrayals of this all throughout this temple, these bread cakes, the importance of the muskets, Hathor giving her divinity to the pharaoh. The man whose dynasty, and priests were dynastic as well as kings, the man whose dynasty went right through the, the government of this temple from the earliest times to the time even of Moses, Moses was a, a dynasty called Sobek Hotep. And Sobek Hotep is described as the overseer of the mountain and the overseer of the secrets of the house of gold. So there is no doubt whatever that we're dealing here with gold and everything pointed to it as far as Petri was concerned. But the Egypt Exploration Fund would have nothing to do with this. Reason being that in telling that story, which was a much more exciting story, we were not telling the story of the Ten Commandments and Moses and Jehovah on the mountain that the Bible told. Irrespective of the fact that this explains it better, this explains why they ended up on a mountain hundreds of miles off route, it's still better for them not to tell the story. Hathor was portrayed particularly by the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. When you see their pictures, these old kingdom pharaohs of, of, of the fourth dynasty, Hathor is always there beside them. The fourth dynasty was the great dynasty of pyramid building. Pyramid building was directly related to this temple and the house of gold. That's how they got their name. The word per, P-Y-R, means fire. Pyramid simply denotes something that is begotten by fire. Hathor is very important in the pyramid era. She's very important to the pharaohs of that era, the pharaohs that, that were said to have built the great pyramids of Giza. What, what was the link, I, I, I wondered. And I thought, well, I'm going to read these reports of Petri. So I actually managed to get the reports to, to find out what was going on here. And Petri was bothered by the same thing. He couldn't actually work out why, why this nursing goddess, this goddess whose milk gave the pharaoh's divinity, pharaoh's divinity, was associated with building pyramids. Well, the answer actually was very, very clear cut. Under the right circumstances, this powder is perfectly capable of transposing its 
own aspects to other things. This powder, if you remember the, the Hudson experiments, actually had its own weightlessness. It was exotic matter. Now, one of the great researchers into gravity from the 1960s was the Russian physicist, physicist Sarikov, Sakharov. And he, he, he wrote a lot about gravity at a zero point. And he said, this powder is exotic matter. He explained that it had, under testing, a gravitational attraction of less than zero. It weighed not only nothing, but this powder could weigh less than nothing. It's wholly exotic, he said. This powder can be made to move into a different dimension if we want it to. Not only can it itself weigh less than nothing, but its host can weigh less than nothing. Now, if you remember again the Hudson talks, remember the pan? The powder was in the pan. Not only did the powder lose its weightlessness, but so does the pan. So what emerges from this is that actually it doesn't matter whether it's a pan or a saucer or an enormous great block of stone.